Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful that you've given us another time to study Revelation. And Lord, as we open the book of Revelation once more, please reveal to us Jesus Christ in another special way and help us once again to see from the past how, Lord, that you're working so intensely for your people. And even now, Lord, you're desiring to come again. So please help us to put into action the things that we're learning this afternoon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to be looking at the woman and the dragon today. The woman and the dragon. And this is found in Revelation chapter 12. We're just over the halfway mark of Revelation. So we'll be looking at Revelation chapter 12 today. Revelation chapter 12, as you, if you had been here in the first session that we saw that Revelation chapter 12 is the central chapter of the whole book of Revelation. Now, do you remember which verses were the most important? Verses 10 through 12, that's correct. And we'll be looking at that hopefully sometime today. But Revelation chapter 12, now here is the chapter outline of Revelation chapter 12. Verses 1 to 2, we see the woman. Verses 3 to 4, we see the red dragon. Verses 5 to 6, we see the man-child. Verses 7 through 12, we see war in heaven. And verses 13 through 17, the dragon that persecutes the woman. So this is the basic outline of the whole chapter, of Revelation chapter 12. The woman, the dragon, a man-child, war in heaven, and the dragon that persecutes the woman. So this is Revelation chapter 12. Now, observations of Revelation chapter 12. This is just one major observation that I want to bring out. What we see here, the woman is being mentioned at the beginning, the middle, at the end. Verses 1, verse 6, and verses 14 through 17. So the woman is being mentioned right at the beginning, in the middle, and also at the end. And then... We also see that a dragon is mentioned at the beginning, the middle, and the end as well. Verses 3, 7, 9, 13, and 17. So two major characters are coming out in Revelation chapter 12. The woman and the dragon. And so the big picture that we can pull from this chapter is that this chapter is about the controversy between the woman and the dragon. Or what I could say, Revelation chapter 12 we could entitle it The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy between that woman and the dragon. So that's the observations that we see here. Just one major observation that I wanted to pull out to get a big picture of chapter 12 before we jump in, before we get looking at all these details. Okay? So that's the big picture. The woman and the dragon. And which, both of which we'll be studying this afternoon, okay? Verses 1 through 4 we'll be covering. So let's get into it. Verse 1. Let's read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, the Bible says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. So verse 1 already depicts and shows us that there's a woman. She's clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So what does woman represent in Bible prophecy? What does a woman represent? What is this woman representing? Let's look at a few texts. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25 trying to answer the question, what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Here the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. So Christ is the husband, the church is the wife. So therefore a woman in Bible prophecy represents what? The church. And let's also go to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Let's look at that text. 
Jeremiah 6 verse 2. I'm going to show you consistently throughout the Bible, we're going to find that a woman is always used to represent a church. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2, the Bible says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So Zion is likened unto what? A comely and delicate woman. Now what is Zion then? Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 16. Isaiah 51 and verse 16. Try to answer the question there. If Zion is likened unto a comely and delicate woman, which is what we see here in Revelation 12, 1, then what is Zion? Isaiah 51 and verse 16. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. So we know that a comely and delicate woman, not just any woman, but a comely and delicate woman represents Zion, which also represents God's people. God's people. And we know that God's people is made up of churches today. That's where they generally are. Another one. Consistently throughout the Bible, let's go back to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. What does a woman represent? 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. The Bible says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may, pre that I may present you as a chaste version to Christ. Who is he speaking here to? None other than his people, his church. He's jealous over them with godly jealousy. It's certainly not the sinners, but he still loves them for sure. But this is speaking of God's church, a chaste virgin. So we see that woman represents a church or a people, a body of people in the Bible. Now, it can mean it could be a good church or a bad church. A woman that comes out always isn't necessarily always saying that that is God's church. As we know, we see in Thyatira a woman, Jezebel. That is certainly not God's church. That was what? The papacy. So we know that even when we see women in the Bible, even especially in Revelation, and in Revelation we see there are two types of women. We've already looked at the first one, Revelation chapter 12, where this woman is clothed with a sun. She has a moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. But let's go to Revelation 17. We get another picture of another woman. And what type of woman is she? Let's go to Revelation 17 and look at verse 4. So this is a second woman that's brought out here. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 4. The Bible says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Certainly doesn't sound like a chaste or virgin woman, correct? What is she? Verse 5, And upon her forehead was na her name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, an abomination of the earth. So we see two types of women here. A chaste woman found in Revelation 12, and a, what? A harlot found in Revelation 17. So, even then, just be careful. When we look at a woman, it doesn't always represent God's people, okay? Keep that in mind as we go through Revelation. Now, we see back in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, the woman is what? Clothed with a sun. She's standing upon the moon. And she has a crown of 12 stars. She doesn't have a gold crown. Many artists depict her with a gold crown, but that's wrong. It's a crown of 12 stars, okay? So these three things. And... This is very interesting. Where in the, is the first time that the Bible mentions about the sun, moon, and stars? Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. Well, why don't we go there? Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. Let's read this, okay? Now, I want, you to note, I want you to note something. The woman has clothed herself in natural things. Sun, moon, and stars. But whereas the other woman what, was scarlet, gold, jewels, necklaces, unnatural things that a man made. 
But the woman in Revelation 12, 1, is clothed with what? Sun, moon, and stars. Well, let's go to Genesis 1, 14 and read that, shall we? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So what was the purpose of the sun, moon, and stars, or the lights in the firmament in the heavens? First is to really to divide the night from the day. The night from the day. And if we look at the Bible, now all, all these three things, they give light, correct? And they did not divide night from the day. They're all there to give light. What does light represent in the Bible? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? Light unto my path. God's church, at least, is meant to be there to divide error from truth, truth from error, using what? The Word of God. That's the first thing. It deny, divides night from the day, but also it's for signs, seasons, days, and years, to tell time. And that's the second application that we can use, that God's church is here to tell time, to tell people the time that we're living in. So, when we look at this, just a big application of sun, moon, and stars, we get two duties or two responsibilities of God's church. And today, we ought to be doing that. Dividing error from truth. And also, to let people know the time they're living in. How do we do that? Studies on the book of Revelation. And I'm glad you're all here. But, so, they all give light. So, really... The main characteristic that how they're able to divide light from darkness, how they're able to tell time that we live in, is from the Bible. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, 105. Now it says that it's clothed with the sun. So let's look at this sun issue, okay? Where do we see sun in the Bible? If the woman is clothed with sun, what does this sun actually represent? Let's go to Malachi chapter 4, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. What does the sun represent? Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. The Bible says, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the storm. So what does sun represent there? Sun of righteousness. So the sun there is righteousness. It represents righteousness. Now, whose righteousness is this? How do we know it's Jesus's? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23. How do we know that the righteousness that we have must be of Jesus Christ? Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. Let's go there. Jeremiah 23 and verse 6. The Bible says, In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness. This is referring to none other than what? Than who? Jesus Christ. So, the son of righteousness, when we put on the son, we're putting on righteousness, which is of Jesus Christ. We must have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, how do we put on Jesus' righteousness then? Okay, how do we put on righteousness? Well, let's look at this. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. How do we put on Jesus? His righteousness. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Galatians 3.27, the Bible here says, in answer to the question, how we put on righteousness, Galatians 3.27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have what? Put on Christ. So what do we have to do? We need to be baptized. Baptism helps us to understand how we can put on Jesus Christ. 
But is this just literally what? Putting yourself under the water you've put on Jesus Christ? Is that what it's talking about? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 here t- tells us more about baptism. Really t- telling us more about how we can put on Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 to 7. Romans 6, 3 to 7. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his what? His death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be raised up in the likeness of his resurrection. And verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is what? Freed from sin. So what does baptism actually represent? Freedom from sin, but before that, to die with Christ. How do we do that? In the verses that we just looked at, how do we die with Christ? What is it? We have to be crucified with Him. In order to die with Christ, we need to be crucified with Him. And that is really the symbolic meaning of baptism. So when a person gets baptized under the water, really, he's first what? Dying to his old man. Now, do we, does it mean that we go under the water every day? No. What does it mean? Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2.20, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So if we are to crucify ourselves, what do you have to do? It says here we're crucified with Christ and then Jesus lives in us, right? But we do it by what? Faith. By faith. So it's not a literal dunking in of the water each day. Remember, we've looked at this text before. How do you crucify somebody? How do you kill somebody? How do you kill your old man? With the sword of the Spirit, which Ephesians 6, 17 tells us is the Word of God. So in order to kill ourselves or kill our old man on a daily basis so that Jesus Christ can live in us, we have to spend time in the Word of God. Have you spent time in the Bible this morning? I pray that you have. I hope that you have crucified that old man. And only then we can put on his righteousness or be like the woman in Revelation 12, one who is clothed with the Son. And that is God's church. Those that have learned to crucify themselves on a daily basis to put on Jesus Christ. Christ, Jesus Christ's church is not made up of a building. It's made up of people. Are you one of them? Am I one of them? Well, let's look at something else. Let's move on from this. It says that the Son equals what? Jesus Christ's righteousness. But what about righteousness? Let's go to Psalms 119. What do we know righteousness is equated to? What is righteousness equated to? You? To According to Psalms 119, verse 172. We're putting on Christ's righteousness. What else are we putting on? Psalms 119, verse 172. The Bible says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So what is righteousness then? It equals commandments. So when you're putting on Christ's righteousness, you're really putting on, putting on his what? His commandments. You're learning to obey them and walk in them. 
sounds like the new covenant in Hebrews 10, 16, how Jesus Christ is going to write His law into our hearts and our minds. Only then we can be righteous, obedience to the commandments. But who is righteous then? 1 John 3, 4. If righteousness is equated to the commandments, who then is righteous? 1 John chapter 3, and verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. Take heed, people. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So who is righteous? Them that do righteousness. And what is righteousness equated to? Commandments. So how can we be righteous? We've got to do the commandments. Let's look at 1 John 3, 4, though. Romans tells us in chapter 3 that there is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that does the commandments. And if you're not doing or obeying the commandments, what are you doing? 1 John 3, 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So we're sinning. Sinners are opposite to righteousness or those that are righteous. Therefore, when we look at Revelation chapter 12 and we see a woman clothed with the sun, we see a woman, the church, righteousness. It's a church that is obedient, obe obedience to the commandments. Something especially that Laodicea in church needs to understand because they are coming to church and what's happening? They're bringing sin with them. So they need to understand, they've, they've been given a picture here in Revelation chapter 12, that there are at least people out there that are keeping the commandments, who are part of God's church. But we see here that sin is a transgression of the law. But if you come over to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, <clears throat> 1 John 5, 17, it says this, all unrighteousness is what? Sin. It's clear. So you're either a sinner or you're righteous. There's no in-between. Do you see that? So what's wrong with the Laodicean church? They're unrighteous. They're sinners. That's it. It's really that simple, isn't it? When we look at this. Unrighteousness. So here in, in Revelation 12, 1, we see the woman clothed with the sun. We see her what? Obedience to the commandments. We see her righteous. Righteous. She stopped breaking or sinning, breaking the commandments, transgressing them. Let's look, go on. Revelation 12, 17 is very interesting here. At the end of this chapter, it started off with a woman clothed in the, with the sun. And then it says here in verse 17, that the remnant of her seed keep the commandments of God. So it's not just the woman herself, but her children as well, her remnant, her seed. So whoever was to come after her, the same thing, they would keep the commandments. Or really they were what? Righteous. See that? Well, let's move on. We see also that the woman is what? She has the moon under her feet. She's standing upon the moon. So what does moon represent in the Bible? Let's go to Psalms 89. Psalms chapter 89. And verse 37. Psalms 89, verse 37. What is the moon represented here as? Psalms 89, verse 37. It says, It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. So what does the moon represent? A faithful witness. Does that word sound familiar? Faithful witness? Jesus described himself in one of the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. 
So Jesus Christ compares himself to the faithful and true witness. So, so we know that as, as, the, as a woman is standing on the, moon, on the moon, it has something to do with Jesus Christ still as a faithful witness. But what is a faithful witness then? What is being established here? If we read verses 34 to 35, what is it really talking about? Let's look at this. Verses 34 to 35 of Psalms 89. It says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I, that I will not lie unto David. So what is it? His covenant. The things that he is what? That has gone out of his lips. What do we call that? The words of God. So what is this moon representing? The words of God. Or what? The Bible. So the church is standing on the Word of God. And it's interestingly enough, we're told, if you search and you find, read Ellen White's writings, she says, our watchword is to be the Bible and the Bible only. The Bible and the Bible only. And that should be our motto as Christians. As, though, as we're given here a picture that the woman, the church, ought to be standing on one thing alone, that is the moon, the faithful witness, the faithful witness of the Bible throughout the ages. So friends, like I said before, I believe that anything outside of the Bible is simply an opinion. An opinion. But you see, the, what was the purpose of the witness to? We looked at this yesterday. What was the purpose of a witness? It was to testify. Testify to those things that are true. Now in John 5.39, we see here that it says, Ye search the Scriptures, for in them ye think is what? Eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. So really the Bible, when the woman is standing upon the Bible, it's not just about the Word of God and prophecies and all these things, but it's testifying of Jesus Christ. Just as we studied Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the same thing. The Bible has to testify of Jesus Christ. Now, in Revelation 12, 17, let's go there. First we saw the remnant, they keep the commandments of God, right? But let's read this, okay? Revelation 12, 17, it says, The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and what? Have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They testify of Jesus Christ. They have the Bible. So, verse 1, we're given a picture of a woman. Righteousness, keep the commandments. Standing upon the Bible, the testimony of Jesus Christ. At the end of Revelation 12, we see the same picture coming out. Commandments and Bible brought out once again. So, in Genesis 1.16, um, we see here the moon is called the lesser light. When God created the world and He established the moon, where does this, the moon draw its light from? The sun. Now, who was the sun or what was representative of the sun again? Jesus Christ, the righteous. Because it said in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, that the Son of righteousness, that is Jesus Christ. So when the moon draws its light from the sun, it's really reflecting the same thing, but in a lesser degree. So really, the moon is a lesser light. Now, what do we know about the lesser light in the spirit of prophecy? Desire of Ages, page 220. You remember that I talked to mentioned about this lesser light um, early on. And I said that the lesser light is the Bible. And we know that the moon, at, le at least from the Bible, we've proved that it's the Bible. From the Bible, it we've proved that it's the Bible. Very interesting. But here, Desire of Ages, page 220, it says this. The prophet John was the connecting link between the two dispensations. The two dispensations, meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament. The two dispensations. As God's representative, he stood forth to show the relation of the law and the prophets to the Christian dispensation, okay? So he's connecting what? The law and the prophets of the past to what? The Christian dispensation or the church, okay? From nation to church. And it says here, he, who is he referring to? John the Baptist. He was the lesser light, which was followed by a greater. Who is a greater light that came after him? Jesus Christ. So can you see that? The lesser light was who? John the Baptist. Now, what was John the Baptist? He was a prophet. 
So really, the lesser light is referring to all the writings of the prophets. And they're all pointing to the greater light. That is, Jesus Christ. So even then, from there we can see clearly that the moon, the lesser light, represents the Word of God, the Bible. And that is exactly what the woman is standing upon. The Bible and the Bible only. But this woman also has a crown of 12 stars as described in Revelation 12, 1. Now what does stars represent again? What does star represent in the Bible? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are what? Are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven golden candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the seven stars represented what? Angels or messengers or what? Leaders. So what do we know about 12 messengers or 12 leaders in the Bible? Keep that in mind as we go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. What do we know about stars? Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. It'll help us to understand what sort of star this is because Lucifer was the morning star. And certainly he is not one of the good messengers that we find in the Bible. But in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, Daniel 12 and verse 3, the Bible says, And they that be wise. Now we looked at this yesterday. Who are the wise? Those that fear God, inherit glory, and discern time and judgment. Really, those that understand the first angel's message. So Daniel 12, 3, They that be wise, or those that understand the first angel's message, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. What do the stars do? What do the stars do according to Daniel 12, 3? They turn many to what? Righteousness. Now, what does righteousness represent again? Revelation 12, 1, what was it? The Son, Jesus Christ. So those that be wise are those that are going to be turning, who? Others to Jesus Christ. Using what? The Bible. So, what do stars represent? Angels or messengers or leaders that turn many to righteousness or turn people to Jesus Christ. Now, Let's go to Galatians 4.14. Galatians 4.14. More information regarding an angel. What do we know about this? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 14. As we know, Paul was a writer of the book of Galatians. And he's speaking of himself. But here in Galatians 4.14 it says, And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despise not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. So here we see the angel of God is also sometimes can be what? Jesus Christ. But they received Paul as an angel of God. So really, Paul was an angel or a messenger or a leader of Jesus Christ. So we know that stars can represent what? People, especially leaders. Now in the Old Testament, The 12 stars were the 12 tribes of Israel. And if we look at these stars, they have a dual application. Because in the New Testament, they can represent what? The 12 apostles. The 12 apostles. And that was certainly only the 12 apostles after the death of Jesus Christ. Because Judas was not a star. Judas being one of the first 12 disciples of the or the first 12 apostles. He was not one of the 12 that represented Revelation 12, 1. Now, why do I say that this can represent 12 tribes of Israel and also 12 apostles? This will come clear to picture when we read on further in the beginning verses of Revelation 12, okay? So keep this in mind, and we're going to see how it can also represent the 12 tribes. Now, let's move on. Verse 2 of Revelation chapter 12. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12, and let's look at verse 2. And she, 
that woman, clothed with the sun, with the moon and the stars, she being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to del- be delivered. So this woman is about to have a child, okay? Is about to have a child. Now, this is really just speaking of the birth of Jesus Christ. How do I know? If we go to Galatians 4, 4, let's go there. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. Let's read this together. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. So when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, Jesus Christ, made of a woman. And could I say, made of the woman that we also find here in Revelation 12, 1. So when this woman was crying, tr- crying, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered, it was representing the birth of Jesus Christ into the earth as man. So we're also already now given a time period. It's around what? The birth of Christ. Revelation 12 is around the birth of Christ, at least the beginning part anyways. But let's go to 1 Thessalonians. What does it talk about travailing? 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, and verses 3 and 4. What do we know about travailing in regards to woman? Here, 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 3 to 4. Let's read this. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, starting in verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. What is that speaking of? Last day events, events leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So even last day events are compared to as what? The first coming of Jesus. The first coming of Jesus. How do we know? Because during the first coming of Jesus, there were wise men as well. Wise men that came and visited Jesus, correct? And we're told to be wise as well. Wise men, too. So, if we look, if you study the first time Jesus Christ came to the earth, it lines up closely with what's going to happen also in the future when He comes for a second time. Okay, but let's move on. Let's read verses 3 and 4, Revelation 12. Revelation 12, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So now we see another picture, a great red dragon appearing in heaven. And this great red dragon has seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And he stands before this woman who's about to give birth. And what's that event portraying what? Around the birth of Jesus Christ, right? So this dragon is ready there to devour the child as soon as it comes out. But it also casts what? A third of the stars to the earth. Now, who is this great red dragon? Who is this dragon? Let's read verses 7 and 9 of Revelation 12. Verses 7 and 9. Revelation Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So what is this speaking of? This great red dragon. Who is it? It's none other than Satan. But it drew a third part of the stars in heaven. What were these stars called? We read it in verse 9. What? It was cast into the earth. Who was cast with him? His angels were cast out with him. And as we already read, Revelation 1.20, that stars represent angels. And this, in a more literal sense, are angels themselves. And as we know, there was war in heaven and Satan was cast out. One third of the angels were cast out with him. 
But what does the tail represent? Because it says that the dragon used his tail to draw one third of the stars to bring it with him. So what does the tail represent in the Bible? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. What does the tail represent? Isaiah 9, 15. The ancient, the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth lies, he is the what? Tail. So what does tail represent? The prophet that what? Teaches lies. Or what do we call this? Deception. And yes, in heaven, when the mystery of iniquity worked, when pride arose in Satan's heart, he used deception to deceive a third of the angels. And then when they were cast out, he told them, it was too late for you to repent to go back. And so thus keeping a third of the whole angelic being with him, a third of the angels from heaven were cast out with Satan because he told lies, he deceived them. But it says that he was to what? Devour her child. Who's, who is this child? Verse 5 of Revelation 12. We already know that this is referring to the birth of Jesus Christ. But here in verse 5 it says what? And she brought forth a man-child. What sort of child was this? A man-child, not a female. It's a man-child. The gender here is given specifically. But he was to rule all nations with a what? Rod of iron. Now let's show clearly from Revelation that this is referring to Jesus Christ, okay? Let's go to Revelation 19, 15. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15. Here it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So speaking of Jesus Christ, it says here in 19, Revelation 19.15 that he's going to rule all nations with a what? A rod of iron. But at the same time, it also says that he has a what? Sharp two-edged sword. Now where do we see, or where have we seen sharp two-edged sword so far in Revelation? Do you remember? We first saw it in Revelation chapter 1. In its description of Jesus, head white like wool, eyes as a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Revelation chapter 1, we saw that. And we also see it in Revelation chapter 2, when he's describing himself to the churches. In verse 12 of Revelation 2, it says, Pergamos, he says, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. So clearly through and through, this man-child spoken of in Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, 3, 4, 5, is speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, he was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. Let's look at this a bit more, okay? Let's go to Psalms chapter 2. What about iron, rod of iron? iron. Revelation, uh, Psalms, pardon me. Psalms chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12. Let's go there. Psalms chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, it says this, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It says here in verse 9 that what? Shall break them with a rod of iron and in pieces like a potter's vessel. If you remember Daniel chapter 2, the statue, head of gold, chest of silver, thighs of bronze, iron legs, and iron and clay feet. And then it says the rock will come and it'll dash it to pieces. It'll break it to pieces. Signifying, what was the rock again? 
Jesus Christ, his second coming, or his judgment in the context of Daniel. God is our judge. So here we see a picture of what Jesus is going to do in the future. He's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. But if we go into this a bit deeper, let's go to Revelation 2.27. We see here what? In the church Thyatira, Revelation 2.27. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 27, it says, And he that overcometh, in verse 26, it says that he, in verse 27, shall rule them with a rod of iron. Him that overcomes in the church of Thyatira shall rule them with a rod of iron. So we will be elevated to the same status as Jesus Christ in judgment. How do I know? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Oh, before that, let's go to Ephesians 2.6. Oops, let's go back a bit. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. Pardon me. I skipped a text here. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. That Jesus Christ is going to elevate us to the, His same status. Ephesians 2, 6, it says, And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. So we'll be sitting in heavenly places with Jesus Christ as well in the future. And of course, the promise to the Laodiceans found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also am overcome and am sat down with my Father in his throne. So even the promise to the Laodiceans, we're going to be at the same status with Jesus Christ as well. We're going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. How do we know? Revelation 20, verse 4. I told you that we're going to be judging just as Jesus Christ judges too. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So we'll be also be judging in the future as well. We'll be given thrones, but only if we overcome. But the promise we see here, that is, we're going to be elevated to the same status as Jesus Christ. We'll be ruling all nations also with a rod of iron. Its literal application was actually fulfilled. This picture that we see. You see, when Jesus was born, there was an endeavor to destroy his life. If we read Matthew 2.13, who was the one that wanted to destroy his life? Herod. Herod. And who was Herod? He was a tetriarch of the Roman Empire. Around the region where Jesus Christ was, Nazareth, Bethlehem. So we know that really the great red dragon was not just Satan, but it was who? Herod as well. Satan working through pagan Rome to destroy Jesus Christ. So really the instigator or the main purpon, purpo, person behind all this was Jesus, uh, Satan. Okay? So this also is representative of pagan Rome, the great red dragon. Keep that in mind. Remember I told you that there was a dual application to this. So that's how I know that the 12 tribes of Israel also are represented in the 12 stars of the woman. Because it was that that gave birth to Jesus Christ. The church had not existed then yet. God's people were still a nation. They were still Israel. So the woman with the 12 stars who gave birth could not be God's church, the 12 apostles, because they had not existed yet. You see that? And another thing, the Jews had three classes of rulers, kings, priests, and the Sanhedrin. And as you know, Jesus Christ was always in conflict with the priests and the Sanhedrins, or the Pharisees, as we call them. And it says here, a third part of these, the kings, were taken away by the Roman power. Just as what? The tail drew a third part of the stars. 
So one third of the rulership of the Jewish nation was taken over by the Roman government, which was the most powerful one, the kings. So its literal application was actually fulfilled in Revelation 12. So this is the picture that we see so far in Revelation 12. The woman and the red dragon. At this point, we're going to stop here, and why don't we bow our heads forward to prayer? Let's pray. Let's kneel. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you once again for giving us such a clear picture of prophecy. And, oh, Lord, there is remnant that is coming up from Revelation 12. As we study this, please help our hearts to be stirred by its message that we would endeavor to be part of this group. But, Lord, thank you for giving us a promise in the future how you're going to help us and allow us to rule all nations also with a rod of iron. Lord, help us to be faithful until the very end. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.